kuriru usu jari Lini uwe Umeriru usu jari Lini pate, lini jenge Ukuriru usu jari Lini uwe Lini pate, lini jenge Ukuriru usu jaribu Lini uwe Umeriru usu, umeriru usu jaribu Lini pate, lini jenge Ukuriru usu jaribu Lini uwe Umeriru usu We have been through hell But there is a God that changes the seasons of men I don't know how but I know there is a God Joseph stood and said Lord Whatever the path of God You have tagged into Basically I'm a bounder Of my father's life today And so we are going to try to make it simple, palatable, and something that you are going to enjoy because this is the word of God. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our Lord, we are grateful and privileged even to have this moment, this night, where we can go through the pages of the written word. And this word is not just written, but this word is alive, living, O oh Father. And tonight, even by the hearing and by the decoding, we pray for the grace to utter that which can be understood in the level, uh, in our levels, and also, O oh God, to release secrets and truths that are hidden in the text, not abusing the spirit behind the text. I pray for your grace, even for them that are watching and them that are following online. Receive honor and receive glory, even as we do this biblical Bible exegesis and study. In Jesus' name, we do pray and believe. And so today, we are moving from private worship and we are going to see what happens in Israel public worship. We are moving from what men did in the inner place to what men ought to do externally. One of the things that we need to, uh, uh, we need to understand, uh, we are now moving from what we are calling narrative to legislation. We are moving from just things that are written, uh, things that we need to do when we are sacrificing, to actual things that we need to observe on a daily basis. Now, this is where now another dimension of the law is introduced, and this is where now uh, some things externally are considered to have the power to defile a man. So we begin to see that Israel, everything was placed under religious light meaning that this was a system controlled socially, politically, and spiritually. Everything and all inspiration were dictated from scripture. And I want to tell you, the spirit of this has not ended. We need to understand that our Lord Jesus Christ never came to introduce a church, but he came to introduce a kingdom. And kingdoms affect civilizations, social life, ways of, li ways of life, and even day-to-day -day operations. And when we begin to introduce the essence of kingdom, we'll discover that majority of us were stuck in Christian dom, but very few people have begun to operate and manifest kingdom uh, dimensions of Christianity. It is in that level of Christianity that religion is birthed, rituals and activity. But when you come to the kingdom dimension, lifestyle is birthed, where the scripture gives wisdom on day-to-day -day operation and what we ought to do. 
So God had selected Israel as a model nation to manifest his power, his sovereignty, and his glory. When Israel fell, God never postponed that assignment. He now selected the church, the ecclesia, to manifest his dimensions. And so the church becomes a very privileged entity that ought to demonstrate dimensions of God on the realms of the earth. So one of the things we see is that both social and political and spiritual life was dictated by scripture. Uh, the second thing we begin to see, um, we begin to see that the introduction of law, there is a sequential pattern, that law never came before failure. So the more Israel failed, the more laws were released. And I'll give you a, a sequential pattern just to see how laws increased. And this reminds me, when I was in primary school, every mistake attracted a new rule. I remember this one day when people crossed over and went to the city and bought bread and came and began to sell bread in the school. And the principal said that day, anyone caught having sneaked the school to go and buy bread will be given permission to go and buy bread for the whole school. That law was not there. But when there was error and there were people who broke a certain law or acted in a rebellious way or failed in a certain area, the only way that the Lord would have, I mean the principal would have fixed that mess was by introducing law. So we begin to see legislations were a product of failures. It was like a response system of Zion. And some of these laws um, were there to tame. We begin to see Exodus 14 all the way to 19. The children of Israel are complaining from Egypt to Sinai. They are just murmuring. They are not contented. They want the quails. Uh, they, they are complaining about the waters of Marah. You know, it's just a complaint. And guess what? The Lord initiated the Mosaic Covenant, Exodus 25 to 31. So there was a complaint and the Mosaic Covenant came. And this covenant was an agreement between two parties. There is what God needed to do and there is what Israel needed to do. When they worshipped the golden calf in Exodus 32, when they worshipped the golden calf, in Exodus 33 to Leviticus 9, the priestly cord was introduced. The priestly cord, the worship of the tabernacle was now introduced. And this came with legislations. And this came with ways of operation. Number three, when Nadab and Abihu incident happened, now from Leviticus 11 all the way to 17, we see more priestly cord. So every failure attracted more penalties and more legislation. We will also come across in Leviticus 17 the goat idol incident and then we will see from Leviticus 17 to 25 they are going to introduce the holiness code. So we see four failures and four events where legislation was introduced. And even in our normal setting, when children messed up, they open up a door for introducing new legislation. Now, we need to understand that man cannot govern himself, and that is why in our time, God has given us the Holy Spirit to govern man. Man cannot govern himself. Man is designed to be under a certain authority and under a certain guideline. And out of this, we are going now to understand what we, we call... Um, social laws, civil laws, and, 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 and the other one I'm trying to remember, the social law, spiritual law, and as we go through this, we'll also come now to, uh, to, the, to the activities, the symbolism, the, the, the rituals, the shadows that were performed, uh, so that we begin to understand the law in context and the law in content. Because there were more than 633 laws, some were civil to govern Israel as a nation, um, and then some were social that interacted with how you interact with one another. But now anything that provoked cleanness and unclean, holy and unholy, that means that a person is defiled and that person did not have the capacity and the authority to stand in the presence of God. And so out of that, there were laws of purification. There were activities that needed to be done. Now when Jesus came, he dealt with those laws. Because today you don't need the blood of bulls, you don't need the blood of goats, you don't need the blood of cows, you just need the blood of Jesus who died once and for all. But at the end of the day, remember the book of Leviticus is a very key is a very key key book because the book of Leviticus enabled us to understand the holy standards of the Lord. It also now begins to distinguish, um, make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and clean and unclean. We are moving from holy 
common, clean, and clean. So these are the narratives. This is holy. If it's not holy, it's unholy. This is common, and under the common, it is either clean or unclean. So, so, and anyone that became unclean because of a certain activity or defilement externally, of course, um, we could not enter into the, into, the, into the tent or the assembly of the meeting. Now, from this, we also begin to see the external interference of the cleanliness of man. The external interference. Remember, sin automatically makes you unclean. But we begin to see that there are other things, the diet system that was adopted. It was believed that out of this diet, it also made them unclean. And this, anyone that was perceived to be unclean could not enter the assembly of the Lord. And as we begin to look at these lectures, we will see the intensity. There are people who became unclean for a few hours. There are people who became unclean for a few months and days and weeks. And there are people who became unclean for years. Meaning that the source of your defilement and the gravity of that defilement mattered on the longevity of your uncleanliness. I'm going to repeat. Some people were considered unclean for some few hours. You know, you mess up and by evening you're clean. You just take a ritualistic bath and you're back in the community. Some people were also considered to be unclean for a few days, others a few weeks, others a few months. Like we're going to look at the concept of childbirth that kept you unclean almost for one year. And there are people who also became unclean for a series of years. Anybody that got leprosy, as long as you are leprous, you are considered unclean. And so we begin to see whatever made people unclean, the intensity of uncleanliness varied with the time, the longevity of the time that you are declared unclean. And so we will look at this. And this is one simple thing that we begin to get. When you are unclean, you have no capacity to interact with God. But... Sin, if I take that example, sin has different impact, but sin is sin. Now, this is this one you have to understand it very clearly. Um, if a man today murders and another man lies, both of them are sinned. But the impact and the repercussion of the murderer is a little bit more intense compared to the repercussion of the lie. I'm not here to say that lie is a lesser sin and murder is a greater sin. But I'm here to say that sin has different repercussions. And even in our natural element, there are people who are born again, but they still struggle to believe that indeed the Lord forgive them. Because the intensity and the, and, the, and the gravity of what they did was quite heavy. But remember, in the eyes of God, sin is sin. Sin is sin. If you can lie, you can steal. If you can steal, you can fornicate. If you can fornicate, you can murder. So God does not put those ranks, but the intensity, the weight, and the repercussion of sin varies. Now, having said that, allow me to go straight to the text. It is quite a long text, but out of this text, uh, in the laws of preaching, we always say you better read a long text so that you can preach a short sermon. Uh, and when the text is long, sometimes it becomes self-explanatory. Many animals will be mentioned. Some of you may not understand some of these animals, and I'll encourage you to be a lover of animal geographics so that when you see them, you can understand them. Be a lover of nature because nature communicates mysteries. This is Leviticus 11, beginning from verse 1, and it's going to be a long read. I hope I hope you'll hold on there all the way to 47. May the Lord give me the grace to read it. This is what the Bible says. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on earth. Among the animals, whatever, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hoofs and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, this you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves. It's unclean to you. The rocky hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcass you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. 
This you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the sea or in the river, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcass an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or skills that shall be an abomination to you. And this you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron, after its kind, the hoopoes, the, the hoopoe and the bat. All the flying insects that creep on all four shall be an abomination to you. Yet this you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all four, those which have jointed legs above their feet, with which to leap on the earth. This you may eat, the locust uh, after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet <coughs> sorry, shall be an abomination to you. By this you shall become unclean. Whoever touches, now we are dealing to unclean animals. By this you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcass of any animal which divides the food but is not cloven, hoofed or does not chew the card is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. And whatever goes on its pole among all kinds of animals that go on all four fours, those are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening it is unclean to you. This also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the mole, the mouse, the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sun reptile, the sun lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it is any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is in which any one is done it must be put in water and it shall be unclean until evening then it shall be clean any other vessel into which any of them falls you shall break and whatever is in it shall be unclean in such a vessel any edible food upon which water falls becomes unclean and any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean and everything on which a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean. Whether it is an oven or cooking stove, it shall be broken down. For they are unclean and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. And if a part of any such carcass falls on any planting seed, which is to be sown, it remains clean. But if water is put on the seed, and if a part of any such carcass falls, on it, it becomes unclean to you. And if any animal which you may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening. He who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all four, or whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, this you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the animal and the bird and every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. What a list. Sometimes I read the Bible 
And I bless the Lord that I was not born in that era. I don't know how we would have survived without grace. I don't know how we would have survived. Sometimes we think the Israelites were stubborn, but just ask yourself if you would have survived. And I said, what the book of Leviticus helps us to appreciate is the nature of God's holiness. Let me tell you, any time a generation becomes casual with the holiness of God, automatically they become casual with the protocols of approaching him in his holiness. Number two, when a generation is casual with the holiness, they become casual with the protocols. That number one. Number two, God is holy. And anything that is unclean could not stand in his presence. Let us look at the sequence and the pattern of when these legislations were written. When you go to Leviticus chapter number 10, two children of Aaron are already dead. And so the Lord is not happy when his consuming fire consumes people because they come before his presence unclean. Now there's something we always call the antinomy nature of God. What is antinomy? In, in, in English definition, that name antinomy means the conflicting nature. It, this means there is a positive and a negative nature that coexist. What are these positive and negative? God is love. And God does not want to kill his own children because they are created in his own image. But God is holy. To reconcile the love and the holiness of God is that anyone that comes to him, the holy standards of God carry judgmental powers. And in that holy level, you also meet the presence and the power of God. So when you are unclean, you attract the judgmental dimension of El Elyon. But when you come and you are clean, then you attract the presence and the power of God. Now, he is loving, so he must generate legislation before Calvary so that man does not die and man does not fear his presence. But under this legislation, God is able to commune with man because in his love, he wants to commune with man. But in his holiness, anything unclean cannot stand his only presence. So when we begin to see this conflicting nature, the best thing that comes is that God looks like he's creating a hedge and saying, guys, in my holy level, anyone that is unclean may not stand in my presence. You will die. But in my love, I am just saying, please, please observe these regulations and these legislations, and you will be able to commune with me. And, and, and for me, when I read this, it strikes my heart deep, looking at the God we have presented in our day. Because we look like we have a God who receives bribes as offerings and releases blessings as reward. And what I understand out of this is that God still demands holiness. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. And I've seen a few men and women of God who are sure on their walk and I've seen the kind of results that they walk in. Because when the enemy, by the way, the first level of winning any spiritual warfare, the first level is when you pursue a holy life. I know we have our righteousness that is imputed. That name imputed means we don't approach God with our righteousness. But the righteousness we have is what was placed on us because of what Christ did on the cross. But that does not mean that being having imputed righteousness is an automatic walk. You must grow spiritually because when you grow, there are things you have to grow. You must know the word of God and obey it. You must be intentional to walk in the dictates of scripture. And you must cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. There are many distractors in our modern day. Television, TikTok, phones, and all these things. And the quality of time we spend with the Lord is so less. And that's why we are manifesting dimensions of TikTok and television, but not manifesting dimensions of Him. Because the time we spend with Him is so limited. Now, out of this, we are now entering to the public worship. And we see the same order of creation applies here. God created the cattle, he created the animals, and he created the, the, the insects, the creeping animals, so, and the birds of the air. So we begin to see that order of creation is what falls. You have the birds of the air, you have what lives on land, the animals that live on land, and you have animals that live in water. The three terrains, 
these uh, terrains and and out of these terrains God is also providing from the air God is providing from the land and God is providing from the sea now the goal of this distinction was to determine whether an animal could be eaten and what happens is that the criteria of knowing what ought to be eaten or not eaten none of us has the ability to decode it it is only god that had the ability the second thing i want to bring to your submission because now we live in an age where people are learned the concept of chewing card in the old testament is different from the agricultural content of chewing card when we talk about chewing card it is those animals that ruminate they swallow then at night they bring back the food and begin to chew card we see some of the animals here they don't ruminate they are not ruminant animals uh, now this time for agriculture they are not ruminant so they don't bring the food back to the mouth and begin to chew overnight a cow ruminates a, 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 a camel ruminates but a camel is considered as unclean a hair does not ruminate but is also unclean so we begin to look at this and we know that the ancient definition of chewing card was animals that chewed their food to fineness and consumed them in that fineness if they are eating the grass they will chew it to fineness and then eat it now um and, 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 and what we begin to get out of this is that there is a distinction of what man ought to eat. Now, we need to understand in the New Testament, this, this law was reversed. Jesus said whatever defiles a man is not what comes from outside, but what comes from inside. Peter is having a dream and he sees this list of unclean animals. And the Lord tells him, kill and eat. And he reminds him, he's a Jew. And the Lord begins to remind him, now listen, Peter, kill and eat, of course. So there are many things that are articulated on the criterion of how God operated. And some of these, uh, I'll just give you six of them, how did they come to this criteria that these are the clean and these are the unclean? The first one is that the distinction is arbitrary. Is arbitrary. The distinction is arbitrary. This simply means God introduced this law to test their obedience. Remember, all these six points carry some partial truth, but all these six points are not the absolute truth. So we can use the six points as a speculation as to why they were encouraged not to eat. So arbitrary, to test their faith from a legal term so that if you don't obey, you have disobeyed and judgment can come. And, and the second distinction is cultic. The, the, the terrain and the people that surrounded the children of Israel were cultic in nature. They were worshippers of other deities. And some of them carved images from the birds, the animals. Like we see the concept of the golden calf. So they carved the images out of creatures. They were worshipping the creation other than worshipping the creator. This is the element of cultic. They have symbolism of birds and symbolism of creatures as their gods and goddesses. And this also could be true because some of the animals, like the vulture that is mentioned here, had a lot of symbolism in the cultic terrain. But again, we cannot say that this was the reason because there are animals that are mentioned here that, you know, did not have any cultic significance. So the first level, we can understand that possibly it was for arbitrary, for the Lord to test their obedience. This is a legal system. Don't eat. Let me see what you're going to do. The second one, we know this ancient Near East culture, they worship the ego, they worship the snake, the serpentine spirit, and so don't eat it and don't even consider it as a meal so that you are disengaged out of that kind of philosophy because they lived in a social environment, they live in a cultural environment. The third reason here is what we call the distinction is hygiene, hygiene, hygienic. And some, some came to argue that, you know, some of these animals were unclean. And this view has gained popularity, especially in this age where people are very conscious about their diet. And there are people who are going back to Leviticus and they are saying there was a wisdom as to why God said don't eat the pig. And they come with all this explanation of what the, the pig meat contains. It's not well cooked. It has the hookworms, the concept of who have even built a doctrine on, on diet. Personally, I believe that health and wealth is all connected to the Lord. I know people who take boiled water and one encounter with just different water, they get cholera uh, or even amoeba. 
and I know children in the ghetto who whatever they take you cannot distinguish it from sewer water to water and they have never been sick you've never had of any disease so I always believe anyone that is a parent you know that it is God who preserves and watches over us of course that is not to say that we become careless where common sense is needed please apply but there are also levels whereby you cannot be too cautious you cannot say you'll stay in the house because you're afraid of accidents you cannot say you'll not take your child to school because you're afraid of COVID listen this life it is the Lord that keeps us and he is in charge he holds our ha life in our hands well it is true some of the animals and some of these animals some of them are quite unhealthy so that hygienic notion again it cannot pass by uh, but again we cannot say that God just looked at it and it was merely hygienic and hygiene is very holistic it's not just about the animal hygiene is very holistic they're also dangerous animals and, and which were not supposed to be eaten but later we see God permitting it the other one number four which is also quite similar so number one we've seen arbitrary that is just to introduce a law to test the faith and the obedience of the people number two we've seen is cultic some of these animals were used in ancient near east uh, for cultic and they were worshipped as deities number three these are just speculation hygiene and i'm saying all these speculation joined and joined together can make up quite an argument hygiene yeah some of these animals are not very good and even today but we cannot build a part on it so if you've been avoiding and doing the diet according to leviticus i know there are people who follow that and they say you know there's so much success i will not blame you but please don't make us who eat pig look like we're not going to heaven enjoy your diet by not taking pork and bacon but please also some of us who are taking pork and bacon life is in the hands of the lord then number four, they say the distinction is symbolical, uh, whereby they view the behavior and habit of unclean animal as illustrated below. Like some of these animals um, used to take their subjects with blood. Um, some of these are uh, uh, um, uh, meaning that they will study the patterns and the behavior of an animal and they will say symbolically this animal is a sign of evil. Symbolically this animal is a sign of hope. And I know we've also been caught up in some of these debates. I don't know how many of you when you see a snake the first thing you think is the devil. But do you know the Bible says be wise as serpents? You see, God decided to use a sheep as a model of humility and a model of disciple. And God decided to use a serpent as a model of evil. And most of us have grown superstitiously believing that the snake is a symbol of evil. I am not here to say that the snake has not been used in cultic and occultic rituals. Remember, even bulls are very much used in cultic rituals. And even some of the birds you eat are used in cultic rituals. But because the snake is the first thing you need in the book of Genesis, we kind of have some judgment over it. So some people just went further, began to give them symbolism. You know, uh, this animal has this behavior, this character. Us. That's what the Lord said. This some of these animals are very deformed because a normal animal should have five five toes. Some of these have two. That's why you have two. But you see, a goat has two, a camel has two, but some animals have five. So they say this is deformity and all that. Anyway, symbolism. And when you are reading the Bible, be very sensitive not to symbolize what is not being symbolized, because you can go to what we call allegorical error. Now, this is Bible study. What is allegorical error? It is when you say, when you see a phone in a dream, you know it represents communication, meaning that God wants to communicate with you. So, right phone, dream, communication. What about if I see a phone and then I see a person? Does it mean wealth? So, allegorically, we can take matters and give them spiritual symbolism, and sometimes they don't necessarily have any symbolism. Uh, they are just there, but also prophetically, those who operate with a prophetic lens, allegories and symbolism are very deep. And the Holy Spirit will just decode the matter simply. Please, don't complicate dreams, don't complicate visions, don't try to make everything look like it's coming from a symbolism. If the Spirit has not revealed, people call me and they ask me, Pastor, what does this mean? And I tell them, I don't know. I'm not the one who had the dream, and I'm not the one who delivered the dream. Can we please pray and ask the one who gave the dream if it is of God, the Holy Ghost to reveal. If it is not of God, so please, that was just another dream. You are just deep in your sleep. If it's not of God, I never gave you peace. Pray about it and move on. Close that door. So not every dream has meanings or symbolism. Then
Then the people who talk about the distinction is aesthetic based on animal appearance. And this is entirely subjective. You know, the gorilla is ugly, so God they don't need the gorilla. And 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 the and the goat looks amazing, looks like a snake queen or a snake king. That one you can eat, no. It's uh, nothing to do with that. The distinction is ethical. This view is similar to view for above the animal chosen taught rever reverence for life. This view also seems highly subjective and is impossible to prove ethical. Ethical. But probably all these speculations, they kind of create a narrative that is a little bit, um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, and so... Uh, um, and so we, we get that six of them. Uh, number one, it is arbitrary to take the obedience. Number two is cultic. Number three is hygienic. Number four is symbolic. Or sorry, number five aesthetic. And number four, number six ethical. And and I'm not saying that this is the perfect list. I'm just saying some of the speculations that have been captured uh, by scholars in theological quarters. Uh, so, but what comes out of here is that holiness, holiness, holiness. Holiness is very key. The other thing that comes out of this is when you study this, there is further analysis in each sphere of animal realm. So we see there is water creatures divided into clean and unclean. We see land and air creatures further divided into clean and unclean animals, that which may be eaten. But above all, we also see animals that can be sacrificed. So other than just getting the clean, the unclean, not all clean animals could be sacrificed. Again, the Lord set apart some animals, the dove, the goat, the sheep, the oxen. These are some of the animals that could be sacrificed. Uh, the grain. Now, the criteria of selection, again, it depends on the sovereignty. And this was not to say that this animal is more important than this other animal. Now, that, that just communicates one thing. That the holiness of God is a form that separates impurity and commonality. That's what, that's what the holiness of God is all about. The deeper meaning of this separation is that the holiness of God is a separating holiness between impure and common. And up to date, when you begin to interact with God, there is a separation that is mandatory. When you are among the commoners, you are either clean or unclean. You are either of God or of the devil. You know, there is no gray area. Here we don't get our salvation by works. You can't be a drunkard that gives in church. You can't be a fornicator that is the chairman of a project. Listen to me, your destination is hell. God is not bribed by our giving. God is connected to us by fellowship relationship and that fellowship and relationship has a set protocols and god will never bypass those protocols so please the church in kenya we need to understand it is good to give our substance for the works of god but god needs your life that is why the lord came to the life of cornelius who used to give to the poor the action was good but the man was still a candidate of hell until Apostle Peter was sent in that house to go and declare the gospel because the Lord was not interested only in his offering. The Lord was also interested in the soul of the giver. So the giving is good, but again, your relationship and fellowship is better. And that is what God pursues. You know, I was in a country that I will not mention and I discovered there was an overemphasis of give and God is going to bless you. I know out of principle when we give, God blesses. But I'll also tell you, out of fellowship and relationship, God also blesses. So I, 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 I began to listen to this emphasis. When you give, God is going to bless you. And I said, if there is a wicked man in this church, he might think that God is here with goods. He's like a hooker. Who has all the things you need? And just saying, yeah, nice biscuit sweets. And he's saying, you need sweets? Ten bob. Then he gives you. And that's not how God operates. God, first of all, needs your relationship. And there are even things that God delivers without even you giving him anything. Because he's God. He's your father. He knows what you need. He knows, the Bible says he knows what we are in need of even before we mention. And that name father is a language of relationship. All the scriptures on prayer, they refer him as a father. They say your father knows what you are in need of before you even ask. Ask and you shall receive because your father, whatever you ask in my name, your father will deliver. So that name father is a language of relationship. So let us not exalt sacrifice and giving above 
fellowship. And let us also understand, when you honor God, automatically giving becomes your nature. Because part of his nature is giving. So the basis of this distinction was just to reveal the character of God and to reveal the holiness and the love of God. I said the antinomy nature. I love you guys, but listen, when you do this, this and this will happen. So we begin to see the division, the distinction between the clean and the unclean. And, and in this distinction, uh, we see that we have the animals of the land, we have the birds of the air, and we have the fish. Some of those birds that are mentioned there, when I was reading them, I remembered one day I was in Lake Naivasha, and that guy was telling me this is this is heroic, this is so and so. Now this is the time I'm understanding why I need to go back and read the book of Leviticus and ask which one is the hoax vulture. So it's that one. So that the scriptures can become alive. And it's such an interesting thing. But if you love the Bible, become a lover of National Geographic and, and the researches and historical things that build up your faith and help you to know beyond the sufficient literature. That's how you grow deep in the things of God. History and the nature. These are two things that just pop up the scriptures. And you begin to appreciate it from that particular level. There's nothing new under the face of the earth. So, so we see the, the concept of Genesis appears here, that these animals were created, the land, the sea, and the air, and then um, they are also here. And I've also explained the concept of a uh, chewing card. These are the animals that are meant to be sacrificed, sheep, goat, oxen, and, and, and these were animals that were reared by pastoralists, and also we have doves and some birds that were supposed to be sacrificed. Then we see creatures of the water. Uh, these are the ones that have fins, that means the fish, and the ones that have scales. And, you know, just understanding the marine kingdom is another mystery. Millions and millions of species that are in that particular uh, uh, in that particular level. And we begin to see some of the birds that are recognized in this distinction, majority of them take their prey with flesh. Like the vulture eats the flesh with the blood. Maybe that could be the reason why it was like this one don't eat. So all the carnivorous birds were considered to be unclean. Possibly because they took their portion, um, uh, their portion differently. The second thing we begin to see is that death was considered to be an abnormal thing. Whatever was dead was considered to be something that defiles a person. So when you interact with a dead thing, you became unclean, you needed to wash your hands and wash your clothes. And if a dead thing landed on you accidentally, I don't know, you're in a place walking, boom, and a, and a dead fly lands on you. Now, now that nature you could not kill flies. <laughs> you kill a fly, you become unclean for the whole day. You can't go walk out because you say hi to someone, that person becomes unclean. So those days you needed to coexist with mosquitoes because you can't kill them. You just have to agree. Hey, please, at six, allow me to sleep. The flies and all that. And so we begin to see that anyone that interacted, even with a dead insect, that animal made a person unclean. When that animal falls on the water pot or even on your stove. Now, the stove here is not the one you have, please. Go back to the three-legged kitchens at home or those molded by, you know, by clay where you put the firewood. Those were the stoves. Now, if an animal, imagine you're cooking and then you realize there's a dead cockroach. You have to destroy the whole kiln. You have to destroy the whole pot. If where you've put water, there's an animal. You take out the water, you pour the water, you break the pot. If that water was meant for irrigation and, and you find a dead animal in a seed, you don't throw away the seed. You also, but if the water has a dead animal, you pour that water, you can't use it for irrigation. And you look at it, man, this legalism was so detailed. That is why when we talk about the law, it's some of these details. And you can imagine the work of the Pharisees was to every day teach these laws. And these laws now become, became a hindrance instead of a blessing. Because they looked at the consequences, but they never looked at the intention. There's something in legal terminologies they say there is the letter and the spirit of the letter. So we can go by the letter and interpret it as it is. But the spirit of the letter was the intention of that letter. What was the spirit of the letter? It was God demonstrating his holiness and love. But they raised it so legal that they presented God as a judge and not as a father. And that's why the law became a hindrance towards even God now dealing with man. And man became cautious on whether I've broken the law or not. Instead of becoming cautious of whether my fellowship with God is still stable. God was seeking after their hearts. And these laws were just uh, dimensions of expression of his holy nature. 
So it was detailed, you know. You find um, a dead insect on your clothes, you have to wash the clothes, wash your body and stay indoor until evening. And when a new day begins, now you are clean. Whatever you interact with, whatever you touch, where you sit, is equally unclean. This was the law. Um, and now some of these things needed the process of purification, especially now if it stayed for quite a long time. Uh, and, and, and this one, as I said, when we begin to deal with the details of this law, imagine you just build a new stove and the next thing you find a cockroach there and you know the law says you have to break it. You just bought a new pot and you find, uh, uh, you find a spider there and you know the law says pour the water and break the pot. It was not a mistake. You didn't kill that animal. It was just there. But again, there were reservation. And I begin to see now the wisdom of God even when he's giving legislation. They said, if you have a well or a cistern, remember Israel was a desert area. If you have a well or a place where there is large water body and you find a dead animal, then that water is not unclean. But if you had fetched that water and it was in your container, then the water is unclean and the container has to be broken. But the water was equally clean. If you fetch water that is unclean, you can't use it for irrigation. So you just pour it and go for clean water. Now this is very detailed. Meaning that what happens when you irrigate seeds with defiled or water that is unclean? Does it mean now the food there becomes unclean? But I also want to believe that that's why sometimes when religion came in, it told us, please pray for the sins of commission and omission. Because sometimes, maybe, you might have poured water and you never knew there was a dead animal and the water has gone on the ground. But God in his justice balance, of course, was not staying with the Yahuno. He was just creating parameters of engagement and relationship. Now, when you begin to read this, you appreciate the redemption nature of Calvary. I said you'll never appreciate the New Testament if you don't become a student of the Old Covenant. You never appreciate the legalities that were lifted. I remember one day I went to my former school that was a primary school and in our day the school was so cold and any time we messed up we used to be punished without a shot on parade so the table would be brought. Big mistakes. Those who used to sneak out of school and those who used to do very grievous things, the headmaster will organize all the teachers and give them canes. And then the table will be brought. And one masculine teacher will hold your hand and the other on your legs. And they will tell you before the parade, which was an elevated area, to remove your shot. One, it was to bring to shame. And then every teacher will whip you as much as he wants. Some will weep insulting you. I can move here. You know they are there. And the whole school is watching and terror comes upon the school. But this still <laughs> never stopped us from running away. In fact, there are people who used to be beaten on Monday and on Tuesday they are back. This still never stopped us. No matter the fear and the terror, there are people who are still hardened. And it is because what made them sin is not absence of law. It was the nature of sin. We will look at this possibly one day. So God had to deal with that nature that is rebellious and release a nature that obeys. So that even if there are laws, you obey naturally. So, and, and even in the natural, sometimes you look at children that were subjected to a high level of punishments. And some of them turned out to be very rebellious. Because you didn't deal with the nature, you're just dealing with the consequence. And Christ came to deal with the nature of sin. And automatically, when you have the nature of obedience, the law will be automatically fulfilled. That's why he said, I never came to abolish the law. But I came to fulfill it. But above all, I came to give you capacity to fulfill it. How did I fulfill it? Through the rituals, the symbolism, and the shadows that represented me, I have fulfilled. And the little that are remaining, I've given you capacity to obey them. And that's why now we begin to appreciate the cross. Because if we were in the days of Aaron, we'll survive with goats and bulls. But now we survive with the blood of Jesus. And now back to my story. So we went back to that school many years later. And, you know, we were just sharing stories and saying how we used to be punished, how we used to have random checks, how the headmaster will just say, everybody come and sit down and our dorms will be terrorized. And if they found anything, it was war. And the students were looking at us and were wondering, what? how did you guys survive? Because they live in an age where that terror was taken out. 
and they live in an age where caning is illegal because the law was changed in the in the era of the Kenyan constitution. They live in an age where there is an office where you can report when a teacher abuses you and goes beyond what they consider your human rights. And they could not understand how did you survive? And some of us, and you know, you interact with those kids, you look at their rebelliousness, the bell has rung and they are walking, and you know, uh, some are still basking and the bell has rung, and you wonder, what? In our day, just, even if the bell fell accidentally, the whole school is on motion, it's like a 100 marathon, everyone is running, helter skelter, uh, this was a phrase, helter skelter like a beheaded cockerel. You know, everyone is running all directions, you know, where to go, enter, study and sit down. Why? Because we lived in the age of the law. And I look at the believers today who don't understand the demands of the law and what they were saved from. And I see them as this primary school where the bell rings and they're just casual. And, you know, they're just basking. And it looks like, you know, this school, we are co-owners, we are partners of this school. Some of our parents will look us straight in the eye and cry because they look at what we are complaining about and what they went through and they don't understand why we are complaining. So ladies and gentlemen, the Old Testament becomes a very key foundation for us to appreciate the holiness of God and for us to appreciate the key and the complete work of Calvary. That there is no man that has ever died in the presence of God. That there is no fire that has ever descended. Why? Because the cross became the barrier and the cross became the door where we can enter and also it became the barrier that if you don't believe in him you become insufficient of the principles and the privileges of the cross please be a student of the old and you will read the new testament with tears on your eyes and you will appreciate him for what he did on that cross it was not a joke that was god paying the price for what man ought to pay father in the name of jesus we thank you and dear Lord, we are not ignorant, and we know you have not lowered your holy standards. And we know even now you are holy, and you still demand holiness and a generation that is holy. Lord, thank you for speaking to us. May we not be casual with what you did on the cross. May we not carry the blood, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption. May we not carry it just casually and think you just died so that we can drive big cars and live in big mansions. We know you are our Father and you have no problem when you have access to all these things. But I know, Lord, you died for a relationship and a fellowship. We have idolized that which you never died for. And we have exalted them at the expense of our work and our relationship. May this be a night of restoration of a somebody that they will begin to understand that, dear Lord, silver and gold is not what moves you. You are the owner of cattle on a thousand hills. But above all, you value a relationship. As David said, oh God, sacrifices of bulls, that's not what moves you. But a broken heart and a contrite spirit, Lord, that's what you look for. And he said, let that spirit not depart from me. May our cry be connected to eternal matters, but not temporal matters and passing wind. Revive your church again and let us be men that are going to appreciate the cross. We give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, we have prayed and believed. May God bless you, may God keep you, and may God watch over you. It's time for us to give our offering and it's time for us to give our substance. Remember, the rule is whatever money you give goes to high school mission. And the giving details are already there on your screen. And thank you for being a blessing. Thank you for always supporting us. And I know one day we'll rewrite the history of this nation. Please, always tag people along. There is no other way of growing in our faith other than having the discipline of reading the Bible and having the discipline of searching scriptures. There is no other way. There is no other way. Please, so put it in your schedule. Be disciplined. This word is what changes men. The power in this word, when it is in you, you become a powerful believer. And no one will ever read the Bible for you. So please encourage, draw people. Here we don't do theological exegesis. It's just simplicity to introduce that culture of reading the Bible so that you can know your faith. So please be sharing this with as many people as possible. Those that are hungry, share it with them every day, 8 to 9 p.m., just one hour of divine truth and the word of God and your life will never be the same again. So God bless you. The giving details are there. If you're giving through MPESA number 0726 714 and 81 70. God bless you. See you tomorrow. Amen.